We all have an interest in knowing what the future holds, don't we? At least we think about it and sometimes worry about it a lot. You know, financially, where is the economy going? Politically, socially, health-wise, for ourselves and for our loved ones. I mean, we're interested in the weather forecast for the next couple of weeks. And we have an interest in the future. And so if I were to ask you, what book of the Bible is all about what the future is going to be like? Which book would you say? Well, I think most of us would say the last book of the Bible, Revelation. But have you ever read or studied or heard sermons about Revelation? Did you find it difficult to understand? Well, on this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, New Testament scholar Dr. David Mathewson joins the group to talk about what the book of Revelation is revealing and how we can read this fascinating section of Scripture. The Reveal, Reading Revelation. That's our study this time on Discover the Word. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Great to have you at the table, or as is the case in this particular study, on the Zoom call with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. They are three of the regular members of this Bible study group, and in this edition of the podcast, we've invited a guest to join us and to bring a specialized area of expertise to the conversations. A New Testament scholar, Dr. David Mathewson, is going to help us as we talk about a section of Scripture that generates a lot of interest, but also generates a lot of questions, and in some cases, disagreement and controversy. David joins us from his office at Denver Seminary to talk about how to read and understand the book of Revelation. Because we do have questions when we read this last book of the Bible. And I think our conversations will help us sort out the kinds of questions that are most helpful and the kinds of questions that don't necessarily take us in the best direction. So the reveal, reading Revelation. Let's get that study underway here on Discover the Word. We've got friend joining us at the table. This is Dr. Dave Mathewson from Denver Seminary. And Dave and I have had some great hallway conversations when I've been on campus there. And it's been awesome to get to know him casually, but brand new to you guys. So welcome, yeah. Dave. Yeah, yeah thanks welcome. for being with us today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks. excited to get to know you a little bit. If Elisa says you're all right, you're probably all right. So <laughs> good. that's good. Yeah. Dave, what's, what's your role at the seminary? I am associate professor of New Testament. Okay. And I chair the New Testament department. Cool. Okay. NT guy, we call him. Right. <laughs> in, right. In right. lay language. Right. right. And we are going to have a conversation about a book that just leaves most of us with our heads itching and we scratch it and we kind of feel like we didn't get anywhere. (laughs) So y'all, what could it possibly be? I mean, there's a lot of books in the Bible that might make us question or wonder, but what do you think we might be going at? See, I feel like you're asking me more because like, what book does Bill not know? Right. (laughs) But I'm going to guess Revelation, especially because we haven't talked about it much on Discover the Word either. We haven't. It's interesting what you said, Elisa, about there are books that leave us kind of trying to figure out what to do with them. And yet Revelation means an unveiling, which would seem to imply Mm -hmm. that it's supposed to be understood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To reveal, right? Yeah. Right. So why do we have so much trouble and how do you approach this book of the Bible? Yeah, I think the biggest issue with Revelation is coming to grips with the kind of literature it is. And you look at the rest of the New Testament, even though it's a little bit different, You know, a lot of the other types of literature that you find in the New Testament and the Old Testament, in some respects, we have parallels in our own day. So we we have letters. It's more common to send an email, but we still (laughs) write and get letters or emails. We read stories and narratives and history, and we read and write poems, perhaps. But when's the last time you read or wrote an apocalypse or something (laughs) like the book of Revelation? Mm -hmm. We just don't have anything similar Although it would have been very common for first century Mm -hmm. readers, there are a number of works, going back to the Old Testament, books like Daniel, parts of Ezekiel, and even between the writing of the Old Testament books and the New Testament books, there were a number of books that resembled Revelation very closely, that the first century readers, when they heard the book of Revelation read to them, they would have known immediately what it was Mm -hmm. 
they were hearing. Mm. And the problem is in the 21st century, we don't write yeah. and have these kind of books. Yeah. And so it is, it's strange and foreign to us, although I'm convinced it wouldn't have been to the very first readers. You said something as you were unpacking that, that, you know, Revelation is an apocalypse. And I haven't put those words as equals or that Mm -hmm. Revelation means apocalypse. Can you explain that a little more? Right. I think that Bill just said uh, Revelation means an unveiling. And that's what the word apocalypse comes from the Greek word, which means an unveiling, an uncovering. And basically it came to be used to refer to a certain kind of literature, which records the vision of someone, in this case, John. So by saying this book is an apocalypse, we simply mean it belongs to a certain kind of literature where God reveals himself to someone through a vision. And that vision is communicated in metaphors and highly symbolic language, Mm -hmm. not literally in, in scientifically precise language, but it's a kind of literature that communicates through symbols and images okay. uh, to stir your imagination, to speak to your heart and your emotions, as well as your mind. And so when we say this is an apocalypse, we mean this is something that God revealed to John through a vision and communicated it through images and symbols so that it would impact him and the readers in a way that maybe more straightforward language wouldn't. Hmm. Dave, would it be fair to say that the word apocalypse has kind of been co-opted? Because we hear zombie yeah. apocalypse mm-hmm. and post-apocalyptic, <laughs> which means after some global catastrophe or right. something. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like that where the word's been co-opted to mean something other than what it means. Sure, you're exactly right. You know, through Hollywood and the mm-hmm. way that the word's been used in the popular media, I think, Bill, you're exactly right. It, it's come to mean end of the world, catastrophic yeah. end of the world. But when we use it in terms of Revelation, yeah, Revelation does have references to the end of the world and God coming to bring judgment and end time salvation. But primarily the word apocalypse just means an unveiling, an uncovering. Yeah, okay. So no zombies are going to be involved. <laughs> right. right? Well, yeah. But a lot of other <laughs> creepy things, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you have, you have dragons and <laughs> locusts with human heads and things like that. And, yeah, mm-hmm. so. so you said that we're going to see in the passage this being a revelation. Where should we start in the scriptures to see that? Yeah, look at, um, actually, the very first verse of Revelation Mm -hmm. tells you about what the book is about. This is a revelation of, I prefer, a revelation from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is now kind of the means by which God is, there's kind of a chain. God reveals it through Jesus Christ, and eventually it gets to John to write Mm -hmm. down. So the first verse tells us that this is an apocalypse, a revelation, an unveiling of God's plan that he will now give to John through Jesus Christ. And the text, maybe we could focus on for just a minute, that kind of tells you a little bit about how revelation works, is the first vision in chapter 1 that John has, and it begins with verse 12. And I don't know if maybe, Daniel, if you'd read that for us, verse 12 through verse 16. And that's kind of the heart of the very first vision that John has. It says, When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Not exactly zombies, but still kind of weird. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, you're right. And and you think about it, I said just a moment ago, revelation communicates through symbols and images. I mean, is this what Jesus is going to look like when he gets to heaven? Mm. Will he have a sword coming out of his mouth? Will he shoot flames of fire out of his eyes? He has white hair. Mm -hmm. And especially when you get to chapter 5, we'll see all of a sudden Jesus is a lamb. I mean, what in the world's going on? John is not giving you a literal, you know, like he takes out his phone in heaven and snaps a picture of Jesus, and this is what he looks like. 
He's seeing a vision of Jesus through images and symbols that say something about who Jesus is. And so you think about it, I mean, just off the top of our heads, what do you think the image of a sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, what does that say about Jesus? Well, in Ephesians 6, it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the mm-hmm. Word of God. Right. So, yeah. yeah, the idea comes out of his mouth, he just speaks. And the mm-hmm. sword in the Old Testament was also an image of judgment. Mm-hmm. So the fact that the sword comes out of his mouth means Jesus simply speaks and executes judgment. And I'm thinking about his words, I am the way and right. the truth and the life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the other places in the New Testament where it talks about that the Word of God is living and active, sharper Mm -hmm. than a two-edged sword. Sure. So it's like this idea of this message about Jesus that's being spoken forth, or in this case, from Jesus, is something that divides truth from untruth. Right. What about the eyes like flames of fire? What does that say about Jesus? Well, fire was used to purify. Okay. And so perhaps... It is an image of him purifying that which is polluted, okay. like fire burns off the dross so that the precious metal can be pure. Okay. And I think the fact that his eyes see is he's able to pierce into and see into the hmm. innermost being of his people. And what is interesting, right after chapter 1 is chapters 2 and 3, the messages to the churches where mm-hmm. Jesus evaluates his churches. Mm-hmm. The symbol of the sword coming out of his mouth, Jesus is able to judge. His eyes like fire, he's able to see into the innermost being of his people and bring about purification. Mm-hmm. It's like John is setting up a picture of Jesus that will prepare him to evaluate his churches in chapters two and three. And we know that, as you said, Dave, that, you know, this is an unveiling of what will happen. But, you know, here we are 2,000 years later, and the reality is we are still reading this Mm -hmm. book of the Bible. And what do we take away from it for today? You know, how do you and I approach it? Yeah, I think when I look at this and I read this description of Christ— I want to ask just that question is what part of this description seems to speak to me? Hmm. What part of this description of Christ do I need? Do I need to see Jesus as a comfort? You know, the picture of his feet like bronze suggests stability. Again, Hmm. not that Jesus literally has bronze feet. It, It suggests his stability. In a world, the world we live in, that's racked by uncertainty and all that, do I need to see Jesus as someone who is firm and stable and a secure refuge in these times? Mm -hmm. Or do I need to see Jesus as one who comes with the sword coming out of his mouth, with eyes like flames of fire, that reminds me of my need to repent of my sin, Mm -hmm. of my need to walk in obedience, that Christ calls me to complete obedience, and he's able to call that out and see that in my own heart, in my own life. So I think this vision, again, is one that stirs us Mm -hmm. to see Jesus Christ and to respond. And I think it could feel really scary, this idea that Jesus can look in and see everything and know us in a way that probably no one else in our life knows us, right, right. knows truly some of the desires that we have or the struggles we have or whatever. Yes. And that could be really scary. That's right. <laughs> except that what the book goes on to reveal is that this is a lamb that lays down its life to bring us into reconciliation and into relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And so what we find is, yeah, we're truly known in a way that we've never been known before, mm-hmm. but that's actually really good news. Right. That's right. And even later on, one of the churches, Jesus will tell them, I discipline those who I love. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of this is not to just scare the people, and that's all that it does, but to call them to repentance, to bring them back to a a Savior that loves them and wants to restore them and renew them and bring them into a relationship with Him. Okay, so Dave, we started in our last conversation, thinking through the book of Revelation. And I was a little surprised that there was no part of the conversation that leaned into end-time prophecy, which is 
at least in my background, that's always been the primary purpose of the book of Revelation was to give us some kind of an eschatological scheme. So I'm kind of wondering if you could speak to that for me. Well, yeah, that is a really good question because, I mean, I was raised in a church that that's how Revelation was treated. I remember prophecy experts getting up and with Revelation in one hand and proverbial Mm -hmm. newspaper in the other would say, look how these things are happening just as John predicted. And Revelation became kind of this big puzzle that Mm -hmm. if you had the right Mm -hmm. piece, you could fit all the pieces around and figure out exactly what was going on. However, you know, a couple things, even to back up to chapter one again, it's interesting in verse three, John says, blessed is the one who reads this book, but more importantly, blessed are those who hear it and keep it. Uh, Keep the words of this prophecy. Revelation is a book meant to be obeyed not to be used to speculate about the future and how close we are to the end and exactly, you know, how things are going to happen and when they're going to happen. But instead, Revelation is a book that's meant to be obeyed. And then the chapters we want to focus on now demonstrate that Revelation, yes, it does have a lot to say about the future, especially when you get to chapter 19, 20, 21, 22. But Revelation has so much more to say than just about the future. We already saw in chapter one, it had a lot to say about the person of Christ, who Jesus Mm -hmm. is. And now we're going to see that one of the main themes of Revelation, in fact, I would argue this is the primary theme of the book, is that of worship. Revelation answers the question, who is really worthy of our worship? (laughs) Who is truly worthy Hmm. of the people's worship? Is it Caesar? Is it some other human being, some other institution, some other object, or God and the Lamb only? And Mm -hmm. chapter 4 and 5 answers that question. Who is worthy of our worship? So Revelation, if we see it as just a book about when are these things going to happen and how are they going to transpire, just a book about the future, we've missed the whole point of it, Mm -hmm. that it calls us to obedience. It calls us to worship God and the Mm -hmm. Lamb, no matter what the consequences that might bring. Yeah. And as I just look at these two chapters, there's a few areas that are pulled apart as like poetic. Mm -hmm. And looking at those, these are words that we use pretty often in church. That's right. In chapter four, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Mm -hmm. A little bit later, you're worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. So again, like these little moments Mm -hmm. of poetic worship or singing or proclamation of who God is. Right. You right. know, that grabs me listening to those words, Daniel, in the backdrop of what Dave just shared. I've read them a million times and I picture the saints gathered around the throne and, you know, I, I picture the whole thing and it's always felt so otherworldly and far away and like one day I'll be there. But what I'm hearing you say, Dave, is that there is an embrace. And I love mm-hmm. the word obey, but I love the word embrace because it, it it's full-orbed and grabs both the obedience and the love that God calls us to. There's this live feed to this image that we can step into right now. Mm-hmm. You're exactly right. And I think part of this vision is to call the church to join heaven mm-hmm in acknowledging who God is and who the Mm. Lamb is uh, through our worship. I borrow this from a British scholar named Richard Baucom. He said, in a sense, this chapter and the rest of Revelation is a commentary on the Lord's Prayer, where it says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Chapter 4 and 5 is as it is in heaven. Hmm. God's will is done in heaven. The question is, how will that happen on earth? And if you jump to the end of Revelation in 21 and 22, all of creation worships God. The throne of God is now on earth, on a new creation. And so the rest of the book of Revelation is basically, how does this heavenly scene, as Elisa just said, it's kind of otherworldly, but how will that become a reality on earth? How will the Lord's Prayer, your will be done, which is being done on heaven, how will that now be done on earth? Revelation is kind of the story of how that happens. And so I'd say when we worship now, when when we worship 
personally, but corporately as a church, when we worship, there's a vertical and a horizontal dimension. Vertically, we join heaven Hmm. in acknowledging God's sovereignty. We worship for the same reason heaven worships. But horizontally, we also anticipate and look forward to that day when we will all of creation will worship God on a renewed earth. Hmm. And to Hmm. me... That's why we go to church. That's Mm -hmm. why we worship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, though, to think about that because oftentimes we use language like, well, what time does worship start? (laughs) Or, (laughs) right? Or, or let's, it's time to begin worship. And what I'm hearing in you is, well, actually, no, that's already going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eternity past, eternity future, it's happening. So whenever we, start worship, quote unquote, really what we're doing is joining worship. Mm. That's right. That's a, that's a really good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. we don't, it, it, yeah, we kind of get the idea that, as if God's up there in heaven waiting for, you know, <laughs> waiting for Sunday. Yeah. So we come out, or Saturday nights now too, mm-hmm. until we all gather and worship. And no, worship is already going on. And four and five is kind of a call for us to join that and then when we do is anticipating that day when the Lord's prayer will be finally fulfilled. Your kingdom come on earth as it is already being done in heaven. I'm reading back over the verses in chapter 4, 11, and thinking, I keep seeing the word created in it, uh, for mm-hmm. you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And Dave, is this concept of creation, does it include the whole earth and nature? Yes, I think basically chapter four is saying, why is God worthy of worship? Because mm-hmm. he is the sovereign and holy creator of all that exists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, it also anticipates chapter 21 and 22, God is the source of the first creation, all that exists. That means he is also going to be the source of a new creation. And that's why we worship him as well. It's it's interesting that in chapter 4, God is worshipped because he created. And in chapter 5, the lamb is worshipped because he sacrificed himself. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, chapter 4 is just sort of the backdrop for chapter 5. I mean, you think about it, most Jews in the first century would have not had any problem with chapter 4. In fact, it looks a lot like Ezekiel, chapter 1 and 2. It looks a lot like Isaiah, chapter 6. But kind of the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. strange part to a lot of Jewish years would have been chapter 5. All of a sudden, Mm -hmm. there's a lamb, and Mm -hmm. he's sitting on the same throne, receiving the same worship as God is in chapter Mm -hmm. 4. That would have been rather odd, which leads me to conclude, Revelation has one of the strongest statements for Jesus' deity in the whole Bible. Because not only does he receive the same worship, in a book where twice John is told by an angel, don't worship me, worship God alone, all of a sudden in chapter 5, you have Jesus receiving the same worship as God and sitting on the same throne without violating Worship God alone. Are there some verses, Dave, you want to point us to for that? Because they sound familiar, but where are they located? Yeah, good question. At the very end of the vision, chapter 22, I, John, this is verse 8 of Mm -hmm. Revelation 22. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, chapter 1 through 22. And when I heard them and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But the angel said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all those who keep the words of the scroll. Worship Mm -hmm. God alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to chapter 5, and that's where you've been quoting, worthy is the lamb and to him who sits on the throne. Right. And it's interesting that in chapter 1, which we looked at in our first conversation, we saw this vision of Jesus, which was filled with symbolism, as you said, Dave. But really, it seems like once you get past chapter one, almost always when Jesus is described, he's described as a lamb. Yeah, it's as if after chapter five, the lamb imagery takes over until you get to chapter 19. Yeah. Yeah. Then Jesus comes as a warrior Mm. riding on a white horse. But until then, the way that Jesus relates to his people is through a slain lamb, a sacrificial lamb. So I guess the question that I'm kind of thinking about as I think about worship and thinking about worshiping God, worshiping Jesus, worshiping the Lamb, is even that word worship, it feels vague, right? Like, what does it mean to worship? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? 
So could you just maybe unpack a little bit of when we say worshiping the lamb or worshiping God, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. what even does that look like and mean and the meaning of the word worship and things like that? That's a really good question. And you're right, because again, kind of like the word apocalypse, we have a lot of ideas of what worship means. But if I just focus on chapter four and five, what are they doing when they worship? They are acknowledging who God is. That God is sovereign. God is the sovereign creator. God is holy. Chapter 5, they're acknowledging that God through the Lamb is worthy of our worship because he has provided salvation. He's Mm -hmm. redeemed humanity. So to worship, I think, in this context means to acknowledge who God is to Mm -hmm. praise God for who he is and what he has done for his people, to acknowledge that, to confess that. And in a world that refuses to acknowledge that, in a world that does not acknowledge who God is and his sovereignty, is worship means to Mm. ascribe worth to God in light of who he is and what he has done for his people. And that's what you find going on in 4 and 5. Yeah. And it's actually, I mean, you said that worship is to ascribe worth. It comes from the Old English worth-ship, if I remember. And here are two cases in the Bible where they are literally ascribing worth because both times it's worthy are you, O God, for you created, and worthy is the lamb who was slain. So they're ascribing worthiness to God Mm -hmm. as the very core of that worship. Mm -hmm. Which in everyday language means, God, I I recognize that you're in charge of my Mm -hmm. life. God, I choose to trust you when I don't understand what's coming around because I believe you are faithful and righteous. You know, it, it, that's mm-hmm. the kind of expression, right? Right, right. Or even just something like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that works. That works. Yeah, yeah. My takeaway from this is when I read chapters like this, I ask myself, why do I go to church? Not that that's the only time we worship, but I think there is something about mm-hmm. what we find in Revelation 4 and 5, a corporate expression of acknowledging who God is and what he has done in the Lamb, that the climax of our worship, however much we do that every day individually, the climax is when we come together as a people. I think chapter 4 and 5 provide us guidance for why do we worship? We worship God solely because he deserves it and because of who he is, not because he needs it, not because he He's lonely and he can't wait until Sunday when we all come together and give him some attention. But we worship simply because he's deserving of it. And we worship him for the same reasons they do in heaven, because he's holy, he's sovereign, he's the creator of all, and he has redeemed us through the Lamb. And that's why they worship him in heaven, and that's why we worship him now here on earth. Yeah, is that kind of a surprise to you, that worship is one of the main themes of Revelation. It's a helpful conversation. And I also think adjusting what kinds of questions we expect Revelation to answer is a helpful perspective too. Not so much when and how, but more who and why. Next, we're gonna circle back to the image-laden nature of this apocalyptic literature and talk about how that can often generate questions and disagreement. And then they'll also talk about a subject that feels pretty prominent when you're reading Revelation, a subject that makes us kind of uncomfortable. People often point to the visions of judgment. We live in a day that I think focuses more on God's love, his mercy. Uh Mm -hmm. And so judgment, you know, what place does that have in the church? What place does that have in the life of the Christian? What place does that have in our world? How do we think about these scenes of judgment? And so that's where the conversation goes. After we take a moment to tell you about something I think you may want to check out. As you probably know, Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries, and we have a wide range of Bible engagement resources, including the online Our Daily Bread University. So I want to encourage you to go online to check out an opportunity for you to go deeper into a study of Revelation by taking an online course from Our Daily Bread University called Reading the Book of Revelation. Now, this course is designed to help you explore the depth and beauty and application of this early first century apocalyptic writing. And actually, it's New Testament scholar, Denver Seminary professor, and our guest this week on Discover the Word, Dr. David Mathewson, who is the instructor. 
His lectures and other class materials make it the perfect pairing for this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. So check out this online course called Reading the Book of Revelation when you go to the Our Daily Bread University website at odbu.org. And I'm also hoping that this will get you interested in taking more of their courses. Our Daily Bread University is a premier provider of biblical online courses to students all around the world. Now, whether you're new to studying the Bible or you are a seasoned Bible student, there's something for you. And you would be joining literally hundreds of thousands of people who have taken these courses. I just recently had contact with a man from Wisconsin who works with a sheet metal company, and he's also an accomplished fishing guide. And he's taken over 50 Our Daily Bread University courses. So check out the Our Daily Bread University at odbu.org. And now back to our conversation about the reveal, reading Revelation. So as we've been talking, we mentioned how many symbols and weird things we run into in the book of Revelation. One of my favorite books is The Hobbit. And so I know what a dragon is, at least in The Hobbit. (laughs) And so like an idea of a fantastical (laughs) creature or something like that. But already we're only two conversations in. And I feel a little bit lost already. We're talking about the lamb. It feels like that's a symbol that is pregnant with meaning or something that I'm missing. And it seems like we can get lost in these symbols very quickly. How do we not get lost as we are reading this with all those symbols and characters and things that feel awkward to us? Yeah, really good question. I think maybe two things. Number one, you kind of answered it yourself, is not to get too bogged down in the weeds and to focus on the overall message of the book. I mean, that's the same with any section of the New Testament. Often, you know, it's easy to get bogged down in, I don't understand this word and this sentence, when you have the whole book to read and to figure out. And so I think the same is true with Revelation is, just as I said, you can still understand what's going on in Revelation and the main themes of who Christ is and God's sovereignty, his plan to establish his kingdom on earth, the heavenly scene of worship becoming a reality on earth. I think those are all clear without getting too bogged down in some Mm -hmm. of the details. But when it comes to some of the symbols, I mean, it is important to understand some of them. Sometimes the book depends on, as you Mm -hmm. said, the lamb. The lamb plays such a crucial role. What does that mean? First of all, when it comes to the symbols and images, a lot of them come right out of the Old Testament. And the more familiar you are with the Old Testament sacrifice system, And what a lamb implied, the lamb suggested vulnerability, it suggested sacrifice, it it was a sacrifice that atoned for the sins of the people. Those are all there with the image of the lamb in Revelation. And frankly, a second thing to say, I think just because of the nature of the kind of book it is, I think we need help when it comes to the book of Revelation (laughs) by using the best commentaries and tools that we can find to help us navigate some of these images and symbols. Commentaries are not a crutch, they're teachers. I see commentaries as, you know, you have that section in Ephesians, God has gifted the church with teachers, preachers and teachers. Commentaries can be our teachers, men and women that God has gifted to help us to come alongside of us and help us to understand scripture. So I think I think even relying on some of the better tools to help us figure out some of mm. these images that are strange to us in the 21st century will mm. go a long way in helping us mm. to avoid some of the confusion, take some of the fear out of trying to figure out this book. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Dave, let me push that just a little bit further because our ministry, which began in 1938 as Radio Bible Class, was founded by a Bible teacher, Dr. M. R. DeHaan, who was highly dispensational. And I think he would have really struggled with the thought that there's not a prophetic scheme in the book of Revelation. And I know that a lot of our listeners may be right there with him. What do you say to those who have been taught a particular view of the book of Revelation that is a prophetic model in some sense. Yeah, a dispensational approach is tend to see most of Revelation as just a prediction of the future. Yeah. 
So, you know, chapter two and three, the messages of the churches, those are relevant to the first century and today. But chapter four to the end of the book is basically about the future. I would say to those people is be open to other perspectives, not that you have to change your own and not that you have to, you know, buy into whatever someone tells you or whatever you read, but be open to different perspectives. Be open to those men and women that have studied the book of Revelation and read it from a different perspective and be willing to change your view according to scripture That's good. and what you find in the book. Mm. I still learn a lot from other men and women who have written in the book of Revelation, especially people from different cultures and different uh, nationalities that may be in a situation much closer to the situation Revelation was addressing. Mm. I've learned a lot from them. So I mm. would just challenge challenge everyone to be open to and, and read as widely as you can. Not that everyone has the same opportunity or time or inclination to do that, but just be open to different ways of looking at the book and allow yourself to be challenged to see things in a different way. So where do we want to go today, Dave, as we keep our exploration and openness going? <laughs> Let's look at probably one of the most common sections. If I were to mention, what do you think of when you think of the book of Revelation? People often point to the visions of judgment. Mm -hmm. That is, you have seven seals in chapter Mm -hmm. six, and later on you have seven trumpets, chapters eight and nine, and then seven bowl judgments. And what in the world are those about? And some people even concluded, Revelation is just really isn't relevant to me because it's just a book of judgment. We live in a day that I think focuses more on God's love, his mercy. Uh Mm -hmm. And so judgment, you know, what place does that have in the church? What place does that have in the life of the Christian? Mm -hmm. What place does that have in our world? So how do we think about these scenes of judgment? Would it be fair to say, Dave, that Revelation is a book about judgment, but it's not a book that's only about judgment? That's right. Mm -hmm. I think if we leave out the visions of judgment, we've left out a significant part of Revelation. But Bill, you're exactly right. If all we do is focus on that, Mm -hmm. and if we say Revelation is a book about gloom and doom and judgment, so a lot of Christians avoid it because of that. It's such a negative book of judgment, and it's, it's depressing. Bill's right. They miss the fact that it's about so much more than that. We already saw it's about God and the Lamb. It's a stirring book of worship. It's a book about discipleship. One of my favorite verses is in chapter 14, verse 4. It describes the people of God as those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Mm -hmm. Revelation is a book about what does it mean to follow the Lamb and obedience and discipleship. It's a book about hope and salvation. Mm -hmm. So if we just focus on judgment, we miss the fact that Revelation is about so much more than just that. Now, maybe I'm being a millennial, but when I hear the (laughs) word judgment, I start getting really uncomfortable in my seat. And so I wonder if maybe you could just kind of unpack what even the word judgment means in this type of a context, especially as we connect that with the lamb that was slain? That's a really good question. And I think the starting point for judgment is to understand God's character. Going Mm -hmm. all the way back to chapter four, God is holy and just. And so judgment is his response to unholiness and injustice in the world. And you think about it, all you need to do is turn on the news and And every time injustice takes place, whether it's a shooting in the synagogue, whether it's the unfortunate death of a person at the hands of the police or whoever, is people cry out for justice. And that's what you find going on. Mm. I think that's the way to understand the visions of judgment. This is not just a capricious act on the part of an angry God that wants to make life miserable. The scenes of judgment are a response to our cry for justice. Hmm. There's love and holiness and justice. And you mm-hmm. think about it, especially when you get to the end of the book, the vision of the new creation is if God is going to establish such a world where there's no sin and no evil and no injustice, then he must remove those things that would threaten that. In the same way that we cry for justice today and we rail against injustice 
as the prophets did in the Old Testament, as people do today. I see the visions of judgment in a similar way in Revelation. They are meant to be seen as an expression of God's holiness, his justice, his love for his world and his people. And if God is to bring about a world where there's no sin and evil and shootings and murders and violence and racial injustice, then he must respond to and judge those things that would threaten that. So in these chapters in the middle-ish of Revelation, where we see the lamb, you know, to go back to Daniel's question and then his follow-up as a millennial, (laughs) the lamb, the lamb represents the necessity of sacrifice being made in order to create justice. And so when we read these chapters, what do we look for and how do we respond as our own take home? Yeah, I think the tendency is for most of us to think, oh, this is judgment for the unbelievers, and this is end-time judgment for the world, those that do not follow Jesus Christ. But when I read these scenes of judgment, I think what they tell me is these are examples of what happens when humanity tries to pursue its own happiness, its own goals, and find fulfillment apart from God in this world. And for me, it reminds me that I need to perhaps not hold so tightly to the things of this world, Hmm. not to put my hope in my possessions, my belongings, my government, my bank account that I might tend (laughs) to want to hold tightly. But instead, these scenes of judgment remind me that perhaps I need to release my grip on these things. And I need to not hold so tightly those things that God is showing me through this judgment, that these are a poor object of my hope. These are a poor object of my affection. Again, chapter 4 and 5, what is the appropriate object of my affection, my worship? It's God and the Lamb only. And these scenes of judgment remind me that all these things are under God's judgment. He's demonstrating that this world is not as it should be. It's a poor object of my hope and my allegiance. And not that I don't act responsibly with these things and what God has given me. It's just that I can't make these the object of my hope and my desire and my affection. And uh, the scenes of judgment remind me that I need to release my grip on these things a little bit more. So in some ways, it's kind of like the fire of God's love is burning away all the things that we think we'll find hope and meaning in. Right. But in reality, God is offering things that are so much better. And he's removing the evil from the world so that Mm -hmm. we can experience the good and better that he has to offer. Right. Which is Revelation 21 and 22. And that's where we're headed to those last two chapters of Revelation to talk about the new heaven and the new earth. But uh, that was an important piece of this conversation about reading Revelation that we just heard, talking about what to do with those sections that seem to focus on judgment. And so before we get to chapters 21 and 22, uh, there is another image that Dave wants us to spend some time with. It's the image of Babylon, and it's pretty graphic, and judgment is part of this as well. And I think understanding the context that the writer and the original audience would have had in mind will be important to establish. And it will help us to see this image of Babylon is something that can definitely apply to us today as well. If you were a Christian living in the first century Roman Empire and you got to chapter 17 and read about this city of Babylon, what in the world do you make of this? What would you probably identify Babylon with? Before we answer that, I'm so glad that you put us back there, Dave, because we haven't really talked about the context Hmm. of Mm -hmm. John's world that he's writing this revelation. So yeah, let's go there. Good. This is a good place to talk about that. Revelation chapters two and three tell us a lot Mm -hmm. about the context of revelation, Mm -hmm. what was going on in the messages to the seven churches. And basically what we find is Revelation is addressed to seven prominent churches that were all living at the heart of Roman rule. They were all deeply ensconced in the Roman Empire. When we think of Revelation, we think, oh, it's a book of comforting persecuted Christians. Mm. However, at this point, 
most of the persecution was rather sporadic, and it came at a local level. The emperor was not sanctioning some empire-wide official persecution. We get this image of Roman soldiers marching through cities and dragging Christians out, and they're getting burned and eaten alive in the amphitheater. That did come later, but not at this point. In fact, John only knows of one person that's been killed for his faith, a man named Antipas that you read about in the messages in chapters 2 and 3. But he suspects there's more coming. But at the same time, the readers were under pressure to show allegiance. So back to the theme of worship. Mm -hmm. They were pressured to show allegiance to the Roman Empire and the emperor, usually at a local level Mm -hmm. by officials that were keen to show their loyalty to Rome. And part of that was pressure to worship the emperor. There were various Mm -hmm. situations and occasions where Christians could express this. And they were under extreme pressure to show their allegiance to Rome and to the emperor through occasions for expressing their allegiance and worship. And Christians basically had two responses. One would be they could refuse to do so and Mm -hmm. suffer the consequences, which wasn't necessarily death, but it could be things like persecution, losing your job, ostracism. The other option was to rationalize and say, well, we can worship the lamb and the emperor at the same time and compromise. Mm -hmm. And when you read the seven messages to the churches, only two of those churches were being persecuted for their faith. The other five were compromising to some degree. And Jesus' Mm -hmm. message to them is not very nice. It's usually (laughs) one of a call to repentance. In fact, one of the churches... Laodicea had compromised so much with the Roman economy and the Roman rule and their environment that Jesus says, I'm about to vomit you out of my Mm. mouth. You are so disgusting. Mm. So the key feature of understanding Revelation is it's addressed to Christians to help them to understand how to remain faithful, to retain their faithful witness in a pagan environment in a Roman Empire, a godless, idolatrous, murderous, oppressive empire. How did God's people live out their faithful witness in light of that? So now your question. (laughs) Right. So let me take a swing at your question. And I'm going to offer two different answers, depending on whether (laughs) the believer in question who's reading Revelation 17 was a Jew or a Gentile. Oh, okay. If it was a Jewish Christian... It's possible that they could have thought of literal Babylon because in their national memory, Nebuchadnezzar had sacked Jerusalem and hauled people off to Babylon, and they'd been there for 70 years in captivity. So a Jewish believer might have looked back at that and thought, okay, yeah, that was a really bad thing, Mm -hmm. and that was a really bad place, whereas a Gentile believer might be more tempted to identify Babylon with Rome. Okay. I think they're both right (laughs) in that the the Babylon of the Old Testament under Nebuchadnezzar now kind of becomes a model for what's going on in Rome. It's as if John is saying in the same way that historical Babylon was a pagan, godless, idolatrous empire that oppressed God's people, that's happening again. Babylon is kind of reemerging now in the form of the Roman Empire that is also persecuting Christians, it's also godless, it's also idolatrous, it's also murderous, and to be resisted in the same way that Babylon was. So I think they're both right. But it's also attractive, right? Rome is this pinnacle of human success, and Romans are creating infrastructure that's never existed up to that point. So there's also an appeal there as well. Right. Uh, Someone read chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great. 
mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. On one Mm -hmm. hand, this picture is very negative, using the Mm -hmm. language, again, that comes out of the Old Testament of prostitution, a prostitute, a whore, which, again, was often used in the Old Testament of injustice, of pagan empires that were unjust and idolatrous and godless. But it's interesting how John responds at the end. Read that verse again, the very last part of verse 6, Daniel. I stared at her in complete amazement. Yeah, I stared at her in complete amazement. That suggests to me that, I, I think you're right, John was amazed when he saw this vision. It's interesting. It doesn't say, I was disgusted or repulsed. Mm -hmm. He stares in amazement. And in a sense, that's the way Rome worked. It was. It was attractive. Look at the city of Laodicea, the very end of chapter 3. They were quite content Mm -hmm. with their situation in the Roman Empire. They were prospering off Roman economy. John stares at this vision in amazement. Mm -hmm. Rome was amazing. It had a lot to offer. Yeah, while we've talked about the, you know, how and when this is going to all happen in terms of the end of the universe, this is the place where a lot of people in times past and present will say, well, who is the Babylon today? Mm -hmm. Right. And begin to assign. But what maybe you're saying is that there is an ongoing transition of astonishing amazement Mm -hmm. (laughs) all around us in each generation almost of various countries or entities. That's right. And in the same way that God is using a city from the past to illuminate Rome, why can't that continue? In Hmm. other words, for John's first readers, Babylon was Rome. But for us today, you know, where do we see Babylon? Where do we see godless and idolatrous influence. In fact, what this chapter does, it it tells us a lot about how sin works, is it comes in attractive guise. It covers up its consequences. That's what Rome did. Rome Hmm. was attractive. It had a lot to offer, but it covered up the consequences. And as an unveiling, as a revelation, as an uncovering, chapter 17 is uncovering the true nature of the Roman Empire, of Babylon, Hmm. and of our world today to show us that, yes, sin is attractive. It comes hiding its deadly consequences. Yeah. And so I think chapter 17 is, it's not just, oh, it referred to Rome in the first century and we don't have to worry anything more about it. No, it, it continues to speak to us today. And where do we see Babylon today in our world? Where do we see sin's attractive allurement that hides its hideous consequences mm-hmm. in our own life, in our own world? Depends which church you think you're a part of in the beginning of the book. Because (laughs) I can promise you, Laodicea was not thinking to themselves, oh, I'm a part of Babylon. You're right. That's why this book is an unveiling and uncovering. Mm. It's uncovering Mm -hmm. for the first century church and for the 21st century church to show us, here's the true nature of reality. Things aren't as they appear. Daniel's right. To the church of Laodicea, they would have never said, oh, we're sinful. We're all wrapped up in Babylon. But John is unveiling and showing them, are you so sure that you want to make a living off the Roman Empire and economy, off a godless, idolatrous empire? Which is pretty convicting for us because if we're Mm -hmm. always thinking that Babylon is somewhere else affecting other people, Hmm. we might be missing a core (laughs) message of the book of Revelation, which is actually, wake up and look around, you're probably living in part of Babylon right now as well. That is so profound. I think you're exactly right. For us to try to worry about, you know, where's Babylon going to be restored? We might be blind to the fact that Babylon is right out our back door Hmm. or that we're in it. And we need to hear in chapter 18, verse 4, John's call, come out of her. Hmm. Uh, Have nothing to do with Babylon. Because most likely we've been affected as well. That's exactly right. Yeah, the image of Babylon, an important image in this apocalyptic literature of Revelation. It was a warning for the first century church, and it's a warning for us today, too, to be set apart from the world and the systems and lies that attempt to deceive us about where our hope really is. Well, in just a moment, we're going to wrap up this conversation about reading Revelation. So let me ask you something. Do you ever wonder what heaven is going to be like? 
Well, if so, trust me, you are not alone in wondering about that. I just did an internet search of what is heaven going to be like, and it came back with 510 million results. 510 million. Yeah, I guess that's a subject of interest. Well, next, Elisa and Bill and Daniel and Dave Mathewson will go to Revelation chapters 21 and 22 for a conversation about heaven. And Dave has kind of a startling announcement about that. And so we'll get to that after this quick preview of where the Discover the Word group goes for our next study together. Do you remember the classic family television show that aired back in the 1960s called My Three Sons? My guess is you could still find reruns of it somewhere. Well, in our next podcast, Bill Crowder will lead the group in exploring how it's possible to see Jesus in some of the darkest moments in the early days of human history. And we're calling the series My Three Sons. My Three Sons is where we want to start. And we want to start by looking at literally the first family. And by the first family, I mean the first family, the first family ever. And to do that, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 3. And as we get into their story a little deeper, we'll see how these three sons tell the story of the early days of humanity, of humankind. But we'll also see whether or not in some dark moments in that story, even this story whispers Jesus' name. That's what I want us to explore together. That sound like a good deal to you guys? Yeah, it sure does. And so don't miss the next Discover the Word podcast about my three sons. And now, the conclusion of The Reveal, reading Revelation. David has been eye-opening and kind of challenging in maybe a way I didn't totally honestly expect to have these conversations about Revelation. Thank you so much. And how do we want to wrap things up as if you ever can on this topic, (laughs) right? Right. Well, speaking of challenging, we want to look at the last two chapters of Revelation and I don't know about you, but I'm not going to heaven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or at least if if I do go to heaven, I hope that I don't have to stay there very long. Hmm. Okay, obviously what we're dealing with here is how you define heaven. Because mm-hmm. if That's you probably define part heaven as being in the presence of God, then where else would you want to be? Sure, yeah. <laughs> That's a very good point, Bill. A lot of that has to do with how you define heaven. Yeah. I'm defining it more in terms of popularly how we think of heaven. Heaven is going up into the sky and floating around in clouds, more of our popular perception. And I know not every Christian means this, but when you talk about going to heaven, that's often what we think is Mm -hmm. going to heaven is escape from this world. It's an escape from this earth to go up into the clouds, into the air, and to live with Jesus up there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And When I read Revelation, I find that its portrayal of our hope is anything but that. (laughs) In fact, in one sense, I can't think of a much more boring existence. You know, is that my destiny to escape this earth and to go up into heaven and float around in the clouds and play harps? You know, those proverbial pictures that we get. Yeah, I think those kind of popular images as you're describing them, Dave, Almost any of us would resist that Mm -hmm. because I don't think any of us with a biblical construct of what happens one minute after you die believes that that's what it looks like. I mean, there has to be something worth going to Mm -hmm. or else Paul wouldn't have said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. And if John calls us in Revelation to come out of her, come out of Babylon, don't associate with things of this world— we better have a place to go to. Yeah. Revelation is kind of a tale of two cities. One is the city of this world, Babylon, which for the first century readers stood for Rome. For us, the entire world, wherever we see Babylon in our world, in our lives. And then the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem and the new creation. But again, if you look at chapter 21 and verse one, how does it begin? John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. (laughs) So that 
John has our final destiny on a new earth. And you think about it, this is very consistent with the storyline of the Bible. How does the Bible begin in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? In the beginning, God created in the beginning, the heaven and the God, earth. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Humanity living on an earth. You know, you find this emphasized, especially in Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians 15, the fact that we're going to receive resurrection bodies, physical bodies. Mm -hmm. It seems that the natural corollary is that we would live out eternity in those physical bodies on a physical earth. And that's what you find going on in Revelation 21 and 22, that our future hope is a thoroughly physical one, an earthly one. Yes, a renewed one, one that's renewed and stripped of all the effects of sin, all the effects of evil and injustice that plague this world, but it's still a physical one. And that's the way God intended and created us in the first place. In some ways, to take us back to like, you know, Genesis 1 through 5, where the whole creation didn't quite work out. And then mm -hmm. in Genesis 6, the floods come and start over and didn't work out so well. You know, this is like the ultimate expression of God's original desire restored. That's exactly right. So in a sense, an easy way to understand the story of the Bible is, God creates humanity to live in an earth as his image bearers to represent God in creation, to fill the earth with his glory. Chapter 3, sin enters the world. The rest of the Bible is a story of how is God going to restore his intention for creation and humanity in chapter 1 and 2. The story is not plan A didn't work, so I think I'll send Jesus and we'll redeem people and take them up to heaven and live happily ever after. That's not the Bible storyline. The storyline is, how is God going to redeem his creation and his people from Genesis 1 and 2 from the effects of sin? And Revelation, at least is right, chapter 21 and 22 is the ultimate chapter, the final chapter of the story where God does just that. And the really good news there is that he doesn't put us there and then leave Right. But he's present with us in that new world, in that new creation. So we can do what you mentioned your favorite verse is follow the lamb around mm -hmm. in a previous conversation. That's <laughs> right. going to be possible because God is with us. Yeah, we follow the lamb right into the new creation. Mm. You know, there's all kinds of things we could say about this vision as far as what's life going to be like and, you know, the measurements. And if we want to talk about that, we can. But at the heart, what is the most important part of this vision is God and the lamb are there. Yeah. The throne of God and the Lamb from chapter 4 and 5 is now at the center of the new creation. And God and the Lamb are with their people. In fact, God does something in Revelation 21 and 22 that he has not done since Genesis 1 and 2. And that is live directly with his people on earth. Okay, so if I can just, on behalf of anyone who might still be stuck at the beginning when you said you didn't want to go to heaven... <laughs> You're talking about the caricature of heaven right. that has become part of popular culture and mm -hmm. those things. You're not talking about living forever in the presence of God and the land. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. When I say I'm not going to heaven, I mean I'm not going to float around in the yeah. clouds in a disembodied ephemeral existence. No, it's going to be an heart. earthly physical. That's right. Yeah. Playing a harp, which... I'd be in trouble, I think, <laughs> if I had to do that. There are some very powerful imageries used mm -hmm. in these chapters, and we've been talking about that since the beginning. You know, what do these symbols represent, and how do we apply them to today? And the way you're describing our connection with God in the hereafter is appealing. It doesn't sound boring. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder if you could just help us point out what are some of the the restorations that we can expect and maybe we can camp on those things in this planet while we're waiting. Sure. I mean, just a, a general observation is there's going to be both similarities and dissimilarities between this earth and the earth to come. You know, I live in Colorado. You know, I go into the mountains and I think uh, this is beautiful. And I can't imagine living anywhere else. Now, if you're not a mountain person, you have to use a different mm -hmm. analogy. But then I think... Can I imagine a world like this, but stripped of all the effects of sin, where there's no cancer, there's no death, there's no injustice, there's no school shootings, there's no fires to burn things down? 
Can you imagine a world like that? Yeah. That's what Revelation 21 and 22 presents. Mm-hmm. And then you have this image in chapter 21. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. That suggests there's going to be meaningful activity. The kings of the earth bring their splendor, what they brought, what they accomplished and brought to Babylon. Mm-hmm. Now they bring to the new creation. So that suggests whatever it looks like. Mm-hmm. You know, I have people tell me, are we just going to sit around the eternity worshiping God? Well, I can't think of a better thing than that. But it seems that even in Revelation 21, it anticipates there will be meaningful activity. So when you say there's similarities and dissimilarities, Mm -hmm. it seems to me like some of that depends on how well we understand what the word new means. Mm -hmm. When it says new heaven and new earth, what is the connotation of the word new that might help us understand that? Hmm. Right. Very good. I think the idea of new means that this is a qualitatively new creative act of God. Mm -hmm. All that plagues this creation, sin and death and evil, is now removed. And the earth is renewed. It's now fit for eternity. It's fit for God and the Lamb to dwell with their people. Hmm. That's why there's no temple in the new creation. Chapter 21, verse 21. I didn't see a temple. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the very things that necessitated a temple in the first creation— are gone. Are now gone. And yeah. so God does not need a physical temple to mediate his presence. He can dwell directly in the midst of his people like he did in Genesis 1 and 2. And maybe that's another place where that ultimate reality connects with our reality today of the fact that we are, as the body of Christ, as the people who follow Jesus, the temple as well, the mm-hmm. ambassadors and image bearers of God in the that's world. Right. So the reality mm-hmm. of God being with us in a very new and amazing way is really good news that mm-hmm. Revelation is painting. Mm-hmm. And the good news is we don't have to wait fully for that because God's also with us today. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. It's kind of like the worship theme. We already worship now in anticipation of the perfect mm-hmm. worship in the future is we're already God's temple. God's people should already be living in a visible representation of the life of the new creation. However imperfectly, the world should be able to look at the church and your life and my life and see a foretaste of life in the new creation. As Daniel said, we're already God's temple. As Paul says, uh, we're already a kingdom of priests. As John says in Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. As Peter says in 1 Peter 2, we're already a kingdom of priests. So people should be able to look at the church, at our lives, and see an anticipation of what life will be like in the new creation. Uh, That's a great way to end our series great challenge to live out what the book of Revelation reveals. You're listening to Discover the Word alongside Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and our friend, New Testament scholar and professor at Denver Seminary, Dr. David Mathewson. And we're glad that you were able to join the group at the table for this study titled, The Reveal, Reading Revelation. The Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, that challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And thanks for remembering that Our Daily Bread Ministries, of which Discover the Word is a part, is a nonprofit organization, and it's the voluntary giving of friends like you that make this ministry possible. Your giving provides people all over the world with tools to begin and continue their discovery of God's Word. Our resources reach people in over 150 different countries. And you can partner with us by giving a donation of any amount when you go online to discovertheword.org. Click on the Donate tab there at discovertheword.org and you can give safely and securely right there. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 